At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed Premier, the Honourable G. Wayne Panton, JP MP. Premier uh, served in Parliament as a member for Bodden Town and as a Cabinet Minister from 2013 to 2017. Following the 2021 election, he was re-elected as a Member of Parliament for Newlands and was sworn in as Premier on Wednesday, the 21st of April, 2021. Mr. Panton was born in the Cayman Islands and grew up in Newlands, Grand Cayman. He attended Cayman Prep School and subsequently what was then the Cayman Islands High School. Following graduation from sixth form, he attended the Cayman Islands Law School and joined the firm of W.S. Walker & Co., obviously now Walkers, as an article clerk. After qualifying in 1988, he joined Walkers as a corporate and trust associate. Mr. Panton became a partner in Walkers in January 1997. During a period of very significant growth, uh, he had been a member of the firm's three-member management committee, the deputy managing partner, managing partner of the firm's international structured and asset finance practice, and chairman of the Walkers Group until his retirement in June 2011. He has been active in several professional, civic, district and community organizations, as well as statutory authorities. He was president of the Caymanian Bar Association, chairman of the Port Authority of the Cayman Islands, vice chairman of the National Trust for the Cayman Islands, and a member for the Government Shipping Sector Consultative Committee. Mr. Panton grew up on the water, so loves the sea and has logged many miles of open ocean fishing and traveling. His love for the outdoors is also reflected in such diverse interests as diving and flying. He resides in Newlands with his wife, Jane. Please join me in welcoming our Premier. Amazing group of wonderful people. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> President Mike, thank you for the introduction. Um, if you had just called my name, I would have come up. It could have saved you <laughs> the time and effort. And uh, I'd like to congratulate CEO Will. I'm not sure. I've lost track of where he is right now, but um, somewhere around for uh, the, passing the endurance test of dealing with the, the protocol requirements. I think um, you'll find that my remarks bear a lot of alignment with the comments and remarks from um, President Mike in relation to the Chamber's programs and initiatives. And I think um, that is a, a very positive reflection of the engagement and the involvement of the Chamber and uh, the various um, members and businesses that are, that are involved. And I, I'd like to congratulate Jackie on a very good presentation as well, so, so ably done. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure if it's, um, if it's by design or by accident, but I'm sure there's a, an incredible commitment behind um, the approach that you have reflected in terms of the dark group's approach to sustainable development. And certainly a lot of the, a lot of the businesses in Cayman, I think, have recognized the, the interest and, and value in that. Um, just very quickly, I want to say um, one uh, matter in relation to protocol. Um, I have been asked by my colleague, um, the Honorable Bernie Bush, um, to give apologies. He wasn't able to make it because he had a, a pressing engagement on a ministry matter. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the members of parliament who make up the government, it is my pleasure to address the Chamber of Commerce today at what has become a very well-attended business event. 
Uh, for those of you listening and viewing remotely, thank you as well for your interest and attention. Thank you again to um, President Mike and CEO Will for the, the invitation and the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past 16 months, uh, we have been on a remarkable journey as a people and a community. Many of us faced periods of great uncertainty as we worried about keeping ourselves and our loved ones safe from COVID-19. Travel restrictions kept us separated from family and friends. We adopted social distancing. We adjusted to wearing face masks and through restrictions on gatherings. And we were prevented from supporting each other at weddings, birthdays, and funerals. And some of you had to face the frightening peril of losing your life's work, your businesses, your companies. You struggled to support employees both here and overseas. You adjusted, innovated, created, and drew in the very ingenuity and drive that made you entrepreneurs in the first place. Some of you had to take out loans or sell assets to keep your businesses afloat. Others ran skeletal teams, and some, the unfortunate ones, were forced to close the doors of your businesses. This government would like to pay tribute to the business community for your collective efforts to keep persons employed, keep your doors open, and to maintain your confidence in the Cayman Islands. As you rallied around various community groups to help the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. During the past 16 months, there have been many private sector examples of generosity, service, sacrifice, and resilience. Too numerous to list. But this government applauds you for helping to keep our economy buoyant and confidence in the jurisdiction at an all-time high. Our collective commitment as a community to put people first and the private sector's adherence to the myriad COVID regulations meant that we are one of the few countries in the world that has effectively contained COVID-19, making the Cayman Islands one of the most attractive places to visit, to work, and to live. Despite the sacrifice and resilience of the private sector, we couldn't ignore the fact that COVID-19 lay bare the fragility of our social constructs. Nor could we ignore the deep fissures in healthcare coverage, while some of our social support systems cracked under the volume of new clients. The pandemic magnified the dramatic inequalities that had lain hidden underneath the statistics of record-breaking economic growth and opulent prosperity. The pandemic exposed the two parallel realities that were both Cayman. So ladies and gentlemen, it was against this backdrop that I resolved to stand for election and in the course of campaigning, witness firsthand the passion, grit and determination of the individuals who would later become my colleagues in forming a new government. Despite all that has been said, at, at the time we were forming the government and in the two uh, and a half months since, I am proud to say that the ministers and parliamentary secretaries and I are all strongly aligned on our purpose, our vision for a better Cayman, and our values. Thank you. We are here to responsibly improve the quality of life for this and future generations of Caymanians. Broadly speaking, our vision is of a Cayman Islands that is held up as one of the most sustainable countries in the world a trio of islands where all its citizens can thrive, a peaceful and prosperous place known for its resourcefulness, or its, di its diligence, its excellence, and its innovativeness. The members of parliament and I who form the government are, on the face of it, a diverse and disparate group, each from different industries, bringing different perspectives. Yet we are in unanimous agreement about the values that will guide our decision making. The four values that make up the PACT acronym, people-driven, accountable, competent, and transparent. 
Each member of my government has pledged to be driven by and to be held accountable to these guiding values when making individual and collective decisions for the people of the Cayman Islands. These values constantly come into play, whether we're discussing, discussing education, new technologies, health care, the elderly and the indigent, all facets of government and life. We need a new way of doing things that will give us new opportunities for our people to succeed. The current model has some broken parts. We need to change how business is done. On the campaign trail, we spoke independently, but once we formed the government, we came together to find that we essentially wanted many of the same, better outcomes for the citizens of this country. People-driven, accountable, competent, transparent. These values, our guiding principles, have helped us align our objectives and shape policies, and help when it came time to make the tough decisions on resource allocations. Despite the wishful thinking of our critics, we are evolving into a team with a shared vision and a clear sense of purpose for our beloved Cayman Islands. Community creates country was my group's slogan on the campaign trail, and it underscores our philosophy. One cannot underestimate the impact that is, that is made and the momentum that is created when individuals in their communities throughout the islands come together in their own neighbourhoods, working to help their neighbours and care for their districts. These seemingly small acts and demonstrations of community spirit by separate groups all combi combine to create a strong, united country that is heavily invested in the well-being and future of all its citizens. There are thousands of people in this country who live on the edge of poverty, one household bill away from not having enough money to pay the mortgage or the rent or electricity bill. Many face mental health challenges and there are hundreds of people, Caymanians, who live in substandard housing conditions with no chance of improving their situation because rents outpace their earnings. Across all ministries, we share a commitment to putting social development, the health and wellness, wellness of our society, and the ability for our people to develop their full potential at the centre of our decision making. Our vision for Cayman includes you as a business community, and we hope you will all join us as we commit to putting a sustainable community and country first. Each of us, whether industry, business or individual, acts solely Sorry, if each of us, whether industry, business or individual, acts solely and consistently in our own narrow self-interest, then we will accelerate inequality, delay or derail our ability to thrive as a community, and in turn sabotage true sustainability between our people, our planet and our prosperity. Good timing on the applause, thank you. <laughs> it is no good for a select few to feast if the vast majority suffer famine. The climate crisis, increasing cost of fuel, the increasing traffic congestion, pressures of de development on critical natural habitat, loss of indigenous flora and fauna. Um, I'm sure, Jackie, that tree is an indigenous tree, right? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Stony coral tissue loss disease and increased hurricane activity are all very real challenges that we face, all issues that we are finding solutions to address. If we're to make progress in achieving long-term development goals, we must address sustainable development. Climate change is not a standalone issue, and its inherent risk must be integrated into all aspects of development planning. We must begin with the recognition of our vulnerability and challenges, and yes, even opportunities for growth. 
To quote outgoing CARICOM Secretary General Erwin LaRocque, the Caribbean region is subject to a double vulnerability from external economic shocks and national or natu natural disasters. Sorry. The islands of the Caribbean community see sustainable development as an urgent necessity rather than a politically, politically correct slogan for the future. We must align our goals with CARICOM and the United Nations through a national sustainability and resilience action plan. My government and I believe that tackling sustainable development is the only real pathway to increased long-term prosperity. Investing in natural capital will increase efficiencies and contribute to our island's success. We will foster innovation, attract the right investment, and increase access to additional markets, including renewable energy and ecotourism. These are ways we can help diversify our economy. Through increased efficiencies, we can create self-sustaining wealth for the economy, the environment, and the social development for the people of our islands. We need to grow green, in short. I marvel at the way the private sector is leading the way on climate change, but a partnership with the government is required to make significant change. Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever and founder of Imagine, says that alliances amongst businesses are growing. He chaired the board of the International Chamber of Commerce and noted in an interview last June that at that time, some 22 chapters of the chamber were putting climate targets in place and signing up to initiatives ranging from gender balance and fighting discrimination um, and pledging to buy sustainably. He said, and I quote, we cannot go on to operate in silos and expect to find answers. It gives us some improvement, but not at the scale and speed that we need. It is just incremental improvement, whereas what we now really need is a step change. I appreciate the efforts of, the, of our own Chamber of Commerce to focus attention on littering and its impact on the Cayman Islands environment, tourism product, and communities. So with, with climate change uppermost in my mind, my government supported, supported me in establishing a Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency, which includes responsibility for revising the National Development Plan. I believe this is long overdue, and I promise you that it will be one of the key focuses of my administration. Development is a driver of our domestic economy, and I know we were all relieved when construction was able to begin again as COVID restrictions were lifted. Before I go further, I want to make it abundantly clear that despite the chorus from critics, neither I nor my government are averse to or enemies of development. Quite the contrary. We simply have to achieve the right balance. We need to reimagine how we do things. We must encourage and promote good stewardship of our natural resources and environment and the use of well thought out design and materials that benefit everyone. We know that we need to invest in infrastructure and affordable housing and address the concerns of young Caymanians in relation to the cost of home ownership, which is fast, in, from their perspective, becoming beyond their reach. We're also aware of some of the very real concerns of many in the construction industry, especially as they relate to rising costs and limited access to materials. We too feel the pressures of the global trade war between China and the United States, but in many cases, production and supply chains have been impacted by the pandemic. We are carefully looking at ways to ensure that the cost of construction materials um, could come down, and we're reviewing duties and incentives for sustainable, sustainable and client-conscious developments. You will have seen that we have appointed a new central planning authority. I thank the outgoing members of the CPA for their service. I also thank the new chairman, Ian Pardue, and the new CPA members for putting themselves forward for national service. 
it is by no means an easy job. In the same way that the National Conservation Council meetings are held in public, we want to see CPA meetings also be made public unless there are very good reasons not to do so, having to do with data protection or commercially sensitive material. We believe that demystifying the work of the CPA will be to everyone's benefit. <clears throat> One surprising finding when we took office was the absence of data to help inform decision making. Data is central to our vision. We have found that our country operates with a remarkable lack of data critical to decision making across all three pillars of sustainability the economy, the society, and the environment. Simply put, better data means better decisions and thereby better outcomes. As business people and industry leaders, you appreciate the strategic importance of data to manage performance and inform decision making. This weakness in government is one that our elected officials and civil servants are working to rectify. But here again, we need your help in gathering up-to-date and factual information. Part of the information of that information sharing will come in October when we embark on Census 2021. As you know, the census was put on hold last year because of COVID. I am grateful that our successful handling of the pandemic is allowing us to proceed with the census this year. The success of Census 2021 requires the successful completion of the data, sorry, of the, of the census process, and Census 2021 can only truly be successful if the results are credible and accurate. Your participation is therefore essential and will help ensure that we have accurate and complete information to inform our national decisions. Our vision also requires that we be reasonable, respectful, and balanced. Cayman can and must learn from other countries where irrational polarization, dogmatic entrenchment, tears apart families and communities. The recent, recent terrible example of what happened in Haiti must be confined to history and never to be repeated. We must be able to have differing opinions without attacking and eroding the characters of each other. We must be able to uh, be willing to listen to each other and truly seek to understand the opposing view. One of Cayman's greatest strengths is its diversity and our ability to, to coexist peacefully. It is healthy and normal for us to have differing views and opinions, but we must continue to undergird our interactions with respect for each other. Finally, an important plank in our quest for excellence is good governance. In casting their votes in April, our people demanded good governance, accountability, and transparency. That is what we've pledged to bring to our roles as elected representatives and leaders. We ask that our fellow leaders in the business community also pledge to practice good governance. In working together, we can see the Cayman Islands become the benchmark for excellence in governance. So just what does good governance look like for the private and public sectors? I'll start with my side. We believe that the people you elect to lead our country need to be held accountable. As Thomas Jefferson said, when a man assumes a public trust, he should consider himself a public property. That is a premise in which I strongly agree, and as such, we will soon be making public manuals and codes of conduct for both the Cabinet and the Parliament. I took responsibility in the administration of 2013 to 17 to rewrite the 1995 Guide to Operations of the Executive Council, which is no longer germane but it didn't have the support to get adopted at that time. It will, the new version will be a reflection of my government's mission and vision. And as I said, these documents will be pu published for perusal by the wider community. To me, this is a serious matter, and it's a serious part of adhering to good governance and being transparent. People outside the Cabinet don't know what Cabinet deals with, they don't understand the standards, and this helps build a framework of the conduct they can expect from us, 
and that we expect of ourselves. The more we can be accountable to the public, the better we are at transparency. The better we are at transparency, the better we are, will get at decision-making and resource allocation. Other governments have talked about transparency, but we can demonstrate it. We can move forward and make significant inroads in dissolving public mistrust and speculation about what happens in government. We must conduct ourselves honourably. I expect both my colleagues and you all to hold us to that. There is more that we can do. One of the things that has always bothered me about the makeup of government committees, national boards, tribunals, commissions, and other public bodies is a lack of diversity. I am glad that I am now in a position to do something about it across the board, as it is now our policy to ensure all people are represented in these groups, including women, older persons, youth, and those who are differently abled. This shows that all people across the country are represented and that diverse views are reflected as well. Many of you in the private sector are already good at doing this. As for good governance in the private sector, I'm encouraged that, that th there are a number of businesses that I've seen and industries which have already begun to reflect this, including um, environmental, social and governance criteria in their operations. Environmental criteria consider how a company performs as a steward of nature, while social criteria examines how it manages relationships with employees, suppliers, customers and the communities where it operates. Governance, of course, deals with the company's leadership, executive, pay, audits, internal controls, and shareholders' rights. I had an enlightening meeting um, recently with members of the Cayman Isles Institute of Professional Accountants on this subject, um, and I think their approach represents exceptional work, so I congratulate um, their approach and their, their actions. Merely doing what is permissible under the law does not necessarily mean it's the best or the right thing to do. ESGs are an excellent place to begin when considering incorporating good governance principles in the private sector. I believe that we as a government should consider how to further support those businesses that continue to set the bar when it comes to being good corporate citizens that support Caymanian advancement and that are truly invested in Cayman's long-term success. Working towards our vision, in our first three months in office, we have focused on reviewing existing COVID-related regulations and programs to either extend or amend them as needed. We have extended programs that provide essential relief for our people who have been the most negatively impacted by the pandemic. The pension holiday was extended, as were the tourism stipend, tourism workers stipend, and the health insurance continuation program. These efforts pr continue essential support to those without jobs until our economy reopens and provides relief to businesses grappling with reduced revenues. Beyond review and, and re-implementation of COVID-related um, programs, the PAC government has focused on the day-to-day -day running of the government and attention to core public sector activities, while simultaneously developing the Strategic Policy Statement, or SPS, for the next three years, as well as crafting key strategic policies for this administration. Specific examples of core government activities include the launch of the National Census, in, introduced, um, and we introduced partnership regulations regarding economic substance to avoid being including on the, included in the EU's list of non-cooperative countries for tax purposes, the continuation of national road in, infrastructure improvements, the addition of new National Weather Service um, of observation stations and ongoing work, and public consultation to remediate and cap the Georgetown landfill. And we're making the Coast Guard a reality as well by producing a bill to formally establish the territory's first Coast Guard, and that bill will go to Parliament shortly where it is government's intention of having the proposal enacted later this year. No reflection of the past 16 months would be complete without an acknowledgement of the importance of financial services to this jurisdiction. Your ability to remain open for global business during the height of the lockdown while having employees working from home 
played a key role in keeping this economy going. Without hesitation, you too created and innovated, supported your employees, and I believe many of you learned that staff who work from home can, just, can be just as creative and productive, if not more so, uh, than being in the office. Your financial performance and government's coffers reflect that. My government recognizes the essential role of financial services to our economy. Now more than ever, we will seek to support, promote and defend the industry as the list of threats and challenges continue to grow. It is why the Cayman Islands has joined with 129 other countries and jurisdictions considered by the OECD to represent more than 90% of global GDP in the G20 OECD consensus for a framework for reform of international tax rules. The new two-pillar plan is directed at international corporate taxation rules to ensure that large multinational enterprises pay their share of tax wherever they operate. And that aligns with Cayman's long-held position. The taxes should be paid where they are rightfully owed. What set financial services and many of your businesses on a sustainable path during the peak of the pandemic was the ability to provide services digitally. Being digital by default remains a critical aim of this government as well. Information and communications technologies are changing how the, pub the public sector provides services to residents, visitors, and businesses in the Cayman Islands. E-government is helping us cut costs, boost efficiency, and improve customer experience. We are replacing the poor person's relief law with modern financial assistance legislation, and the new Ministry of Investment, Innovation, and Social Development is moving forward with the National ID Program, which will transform the way in which you conduct business with government. This should roll out later, or early, in the early part of next year. We also recognize that the increase in digital and online business means an entirely new set of challenges for our Royal Cayman Islands Police Service. Crime has also gone digital, and so the police services, service is continually wrapping up its cyber crime resources. We vow to lend our full support to the police to ensure that Cayman re remains a strong, safe, and desirable place to live and conduct business. A strong economy must be underpin underpinned by safety and consumer confidence. So I wish to acknowledge the police service for being innovative and moving with the times. The success of business, businesses in the Cayman Islands means the success of government and our economy. That success gives businesses an opportunity to create jobs for our people, and it gives our people an opportunity to contribute to the economic well-being of the country. On economic matters, my government has reviewed and reforecasted government's current and projected financial position. We can't accurately plan for the future if we don't know what the cost of our actions or inaction are. As I express thanks to the Deputy Premier and his team for our updated forecast, I think everyone in this room is thankful to the Caymanians and residents of these islands who have kept our economy going by supporting local businesses. I know many businesses would not have survived without citizens shopping locally, taking staycations, eating out, supporting charitable events, and deliberately investing in our economy. Next week, we will table the 2022-2024 Strategic Policy Statement in Parliament. That document provides medium-term economic and financial forecasts for government for the next three financial years, covering the period from 1st January 2022 to 31st December 2024, along with government's broad strategic outcomes, which will guide the development and implementation of government's policy during this period. The SPS demonstrates my government's continued commitment to managing public finances responsibly. 
On the heels of that, my government will produce its first budget. I've taken you through our work since coming into office to build a better, different Cayman where everyone can succeed. The first step in achieving our recovery and larger, long-term goals for these islands must undoubtedly be the safe reopening of our borders and rebuilding of our economy. Key to Cayman's success story is a strong, robust, and diverse economy. We know that. And we understand that we cannot continue without unlocking our full economy. We also understand that we will need your help to get there. And we're asking that you work in partnership with us for the benefit of your businesses and these islands, which we all call home. Everything that we do, everything that we propose is towards the betterment of the Cayman Islands as a whole. Just as the business community joined with the government in the suppression of the COVID-19 pandemic, we need you to join us in the rebuilding phase. As we prepare to reopen, let's continue to use this opportunity to build a better tourism industry and to better place Caymanians to populate this industry. Sorry, prepare Caymanians to populate this industry and place them. But first, we must reopen safely. And that has always been contingent on us following the science and trusting the medical advice. Let's be honest, many people had their doubts. The previous administration set out a lofty goal of burning out COVID in our community. And yes, I got the phone calls from many members of the community asking me to lend my voice to those opposed to the strict public health initiatives and measures taken. I refused to speak out because I supported the approach taken by the previous administration. But let me be clear, our government intends to reopen the economy to tourism in a safe, responsible and careful way. And I thank all of those who have contributed to helping the work of government during the ongoing pandemic. My sincere gratitude goes out to all of our healthcare professionals and public health staff at the forefront of testing and vaccinations. Indeed, we all owe a debt of gratitude to the hundreds of public servants who have worked tirelessly during this pandemic to keep our islands going. Our well-being, community health and safety is a direct result of their professionalism, commitment and sacrifice. Early on in our battle with the pandemic, the Cayman Islands took a conscious approach to be guided by the science, and all our decisions have been made based on scientific data and recommendations from our healthcare experts. If we want to continue to enjoy the freedom of movement and safely reopen our economy, then these are two things that we will have to do. One, meet our vaccination target. And two, continually test and monitor the existence a variance of concern that, if you had watched closely around the world, have the potential to reverse gains and force communities back into lockdowns. I hope that we all realize how lucky and blessed we are in the Cayman Islands and how enormously grateful every man, woman and child should be to the United Kingdom for providing us with the best vaccination that exists today for free. I first heard the expression of going from vaccination hesitancy to vaccination desperation in the context of India where there was a massive surge of COVID infection. But during discussions recently with CARICOM heads of government this week, it truly stuck, struck me how relevant that is in our regional context. Because many of our neighbours, ladies and gentlemen, are struggling to obtain access to a vaccine supply. We have truly been blessed, and thanks to the support of Public Health England and ad advocacy from our Governor's Office, we have continued to improve our lab facilities and, and have now taken a major step forward by acquiring the capacity to conduct 
genome sequencing in the Cayman Islands. That is an absolute game changer and something that we should be exceedingly proud of achieving. One particular story I pause to highlight is that of a very talented and incredible young Caymanian on the cutting edge of science whose work is playing a seminal role in, role in leading our charge to safely reopen our borders. Mr. Jonathan Smelly had initially applied to be a medical intern in the emergency department at the government hospital. But his qualifications of a bachelor's in cell biology and two masters, one in medical genetics and genomics and the other in systems and synthetic biology, landed him in a forensic assistant role in March 2020, less than a week before hard lockdown was instituted. While working within the lab, he developed a proposal to start next generation genome sequencing. While the genome sequencing project is focused specifically on, the, on sequencing the different strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, Mr. Smelly and his colleagues are actively working on implementing medical genetic testing to service the local population. And Jonathan is by no means the only Caymanian in the lab. Beverly Nunez, who started her career in forensics at the Health Services Authority in 2010 as a forensic analyst, advanced in her career and in 2019 became Cayman's first qualified female Caymanian forensic scientist. She is the acting forensic manager and quality manager for the department where she leads the forensic staff, hires new staff members and ensures that everything within the department runs smoothly. I'd like to also mention two other young Caymanian female laboratory technologists, Nisha Miller and Tanisha Gilbert, who both worked in the COVID lab. They performed the important tasks of preparing the COVID samples for PCR testing and conducting tests with the gene expert machine. We're deeply grateful to these experts, and I take this opportunity to highlight the significance of the growing field of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics to our young people. Imagine for a second where we would find ourselves today had these brilliant young Caymanians been discouraged from pursuing their passion for the sciences. Some skeptics would simply say the solution is easy. Just take out a few work permits. Well, that's not a solution. The point I wish to make for our partners in tourism and across all industries in Cayman is that if we can have a Caymanian like Jonathan Smelly conduct genome sequencing, then we must be able to find Caymanians who can manage hotels, food and beverage, or lead banks. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan and Beverly attained their great heights, not only by their own grit, that for sure, but not only by that not only by their own determination and diligence, but because their employer, the Health Services Authority, simply didn't take the easy route and pursue work permits. In fact, they supported their ongoing studies, and today, both employer and the employees have benefited. But more importantly, we as a country have benefited. This kind of successful partnership is what is critically needed in protecting the very tourism industry we all so desperately wish to see reopened and restarted. I salute the Health Services Authority. I salute these amazing Caymanians. And I salute every company in Cayman, every business in Cayman, every business leader in Cayman that seeks to take that approach. Key to our economic success is maximizing Caymanian employment, both in tourism and across all sectors of our economy. We have the most opportune moment now as we begin to reopen our economy. 
Our government-sponsored tourism structure between the Ministry of Tourism and Transport and the Department of, France of Tourism has been supporting and developing our existing pool of Caymanian hospitality industry workers through the shutdown of our tourism industry. In addition to financial assistance in the form of stipends and grants, we continue to offer skills training and refresher courses for tourism-related businesses and staff. As part of our targeted efforts to prepare the local workforce for reopening, Workforce Opportunities and Residency Cayman, better known as WORC or WRC, the Ministry of Tourism, Department of Tourism, University College of the Cayman Islands, and the Cayman Islands Tourism Association has been collaborating on initiatives to reduce Caymanian unemployment through training for employment in the tourism industry. WORC and our other tourism stakeholders will help ensure that the necessary personnel are actively working with these job seekers to secure employment. Toward the end of the summer and into the fall, WORK intends to launch a three-stage, three-level approach, rather, training program that will be geared to preparing Caymanian job seekers for long-term careers within the tourism industry. We are aware of the concerns of business owners that there won't be enough workers to fill available positions once the country reopens. However, we are assured that through our cross-partnership initiatives, there will be many capable Caymanians available to fill these positions. As we head into reopening, we ask of all businesses, but especially those in the tourism industry, to hire Caymanians first. You now have the time, the opportunity, and the incentive to train and nurture Caymanian talent in hospitality. We, do more, we need to do more than just pay lip service to the fact that we need to empower our own people to have the ability to share in the miracle of the Cayman Islands. Let's start now by truly training up our people so that their future, the futures of their children, will mean they will own, as well, a small piece of that miracle. It's not the lone job of government, and it's not your job singularly either. It's going to take both of us. You telling government what we need to do to help you successfully prepare our people for the workforce here at home and globally, and government giving you the abilities and tools to do that. Who knows, through the enforced hardship of the pandemic may come a glorious result. The Caymanianization of our tourism product. We have done the research and, hard, and heard time and again that visitors want to meet the locals of the country they are visiting. This is the time that we can make this go from a wish to a reality. We are realistic, however. We do recognize that we have many wonderful individuals who have been granted work permits who are a credit to our tourism product. Many of them have worked side by side with their Caymanian colleagues in the trenches and faced the hardships of COVID as well. Let me say here that we anticipate your concerns about the processing of significant volumes of work permits and the logistics of having workers come in who are not yet vaccinated, but who have agreed to be vaccinated on entry, as well as the issues around airlift considerations. We're prepared to work with you on all these issues. And we cannot talk about tourism without talking about one of our most precious resources, and that's our environment. Already the PAC government has agreed on measures to help tackle environmental problems such as the annual threat of sargassum weed in the sea and on our shorelines, stony coral tissue loss disease, critical tursing, uh, turtle nesting habitats, and invasive species regulations. Further afield, we have agreed in principle to a temporary 12-month moratorium on new wildlife interaction zone licenses, made appointments to critical boards that oversee our environment. Uh, the Energy Health Policy Council has agreed to begin the five-year review process of the national energy policy. And I've been in discussions with Lord Ahmed, the Minister of State for the Commonwealth, about our plans to review update and adopt the draft climate change policy, which has languished for too long. As I said before, 
Many of you know me, you know what I stand for. Protecting the environment of the Cayman Islands is one of my deep passions. If we lose that, um, I think we lose everything. And it is with our pristine environment and a vaccinated populace that we can begin welcoming visitors back, vaccinated visitors back to our beautiful islands. So, ladies and gentlemen, that leads on to the reopening plan, which I'll get to in more detail shortly. But first, another goal that needs to quickly become a reality is reaching our vaccination numbers. I have to thank President Mike and other chamber members for backing my government's push in May to get citizens vaccinated. Working together, we achieved the goal of using our stockpile of free vaccinations before they expired. Now we need to work together again because the cornerstone of our safe reopening plan for the Cayman Islands is a high prevalence of vaccinations in our local population. You will have all seen the revised population numbers and realize that with a goal of vaccinating 80% of our population, we have a harder challenge to meet. So we're asking for your help with this too. Please, if you haven't already do, done so, encourage your staff, especially all frontline members, to get vaccinated as soon as possible. We have a significant supply available, courtesy of the United Kingdom. The sooner we reach our vaccination target, the sooner we'll be on our road to economic recovery from this pandemic. Toward this end, government will require proof of vaccination for both renewal and new work permits as a part of our phased reopening process. Please impress upon your existing employees on work permits that if they refuse to get vaccinated, they may no longer be able to work in the Cayman Islands. It is a critical public health issue. We must all, sorry, we must do all that we can to get as close to that 80% vaccination um, mark as possible, our optimal target, which has been advised by Public Health England. I said previously at the last government press briefing that we expect, are expected to begin a phase reopening in mid-September, and this goal remains on target. I will reiterate, the key aspect of our phase, phase reopening plan is the safety of our population. We want to avoid people becoming seriously ill, or even worse, dying. As a country, we have done everything possible to avoid this so far, and we must continue in this effort. It is for this reason, to keep our people safe, that we have decided on a phased approach to reopening. Chief Medical Officer, Officer Dr. Lee, Dr. John Lee is working with, country, with countries to ensure that we are able to verify their vaccines just as we do now with our own Health Services Authority and the United Kingdom. Again, our main effort is to keep you and our community safe. We have to guarantee that the people we let into the country and who say they have been vaccinated uh, can be verified as such. I add that as we begin relax, to relax uh, restrictions and the move to reopen borders, we must acknowledge this presents a, a slight increase in risk. And the latest advice from Dr. Lee is to urge the elderly and vulnerable to consider wearing masks indoors. This reopening plan I am presenting to you first today is our country's best case scenario. Our goal is to locally manage the risk of transmission and prevent individuals from becoming seriously ill by maximizing vac vaccination rates and continued surveillance testing through each phase. I will take you broadly through each phase of the reopening plan now, but rest assured that government will continue its ongoing national communications campaign to announce clearly when things are happening and what it means for our community. 
Our plan is a phased approach, as I said, which allows assessment at each phase. Assessments based on the medical science and data. And this will be used to progress or change our plans. Transition between phases will be determined by the Chief Medical Officer's assessment of tourism source, source markets by prevalence rates, um, levels of hospitalization and death rates, levels of vaccination rates, and presence of variants of concern, along with our local vaccination rate goal of 80%. At all phases, public health will monitor the local prevalence rate and the spread of COVID with reduced restrictions. The trigger for introduction of public health intervention in all phases will be two non-related community clusters requiring hospital admission. We are, of course, now in phase one. This phase features continued local uptake of the COVID-19 vaccination and low prevalence rates in Cayman, in the key, sorry, key Cayman travel markets which has allowed for the introduction of reduced quarantine periods and other travel restrictions. However, the borders remain closed and travel is supposed to be allowed for essential reasons only. Specific aspects of this phase in includes uh, entry PCR testing being required for all, a negative PCR test result in, uh, is required to exit quarantine Verifiably certified vaccinated travelers have a five-day quarantine period, and unverified vaccinated travelers have a 10-day quarantine period, and unvaccinated travelers have a 14-day um, quarantine period. As of 1st July, government will begin paying for quarantine at government-run facilities only for those who are conducting essential travel. Phase two will feature reduced repatriation restrictions and is scheduled to begin on August 9th, 2021. During this phase, we will increase the monitoring of vaccinated travelers. Sorry, we will ease the monitoring of vaccinated travelers by removal of GPS monitoring. This will allow the government to assess local impacts and build capacity to manage increased traveler volumes anticipated with the opening of the borders in phase three. All businesses will be required to mandate, sorry, to adhere to the safety protocols issued by regulators and industry which comply with the Caribbean Public Health Agency guidelines. In phase three, which is anticipated to begin on September 9th, we plan for a limited introduction of tourism. At that date, we will be beyond the time frame of schools opening, so we'll not be opening our borders at the same time as our children are preparing to go back to school. Also, we are doing this during our traditional slow season with some restrictions, which include a flight slot management system to limit the number of people arriving. This allows for government and the tourism industry to develop capacity for dealing with larger volumes of travelers in preparation for high season. During phase three, our borders will be open to securely verified vaccinated travelers, except for cruise travelers. A Cayman Islands Airport Authority slot management system will manage flight volumes and schedules and medical insurance Coverage will be required of inbound travellers. Quarantine will be allowed at all hotels and other tourism accommodations with periodic spot visits for vaccinated persons in quarantine. In phase four, which is scheduled to begin on October 14th, we will remove the requirement to quarantine for all securely verified vaccinated travellers. We anticipate that the rate of local vaccination will be substantially adequate by this time to allow for the safe increase in tourism and relaxation of restrictions. However, during phase four, unvaccinated travelers 
will continue to be required to apply for entry on the Cayman, on the travel Cayman portal. Va vaccinated travelers will be required to make a declaration of travel and include their vaccination status on the travel Cayman portal with a declaration certificate issued and vaccination checked on arrival. Public gathering limits may also be decreased at this time, depending on whether there's any public health risk being demonstrated. Additionally, during phase four, there will be fines mandated for travelers failing to abide by this process, and school staff will be required to undergo surveillance PCR testing. Further loosening of travel restrictions will come with phase five, when we will allow unvaccinated children younger than the eligible vaccination age to travel with vaccinated adult tourists. Phase five is expected to begin in November, on November 18th. During phase five, unvaccinated children younger than 12 will not be required to quarantine. PCR testing will be required for local unvaccinated children older than five who have tra traveled prior to being allowed to return to school. There will be surveillance of unvaccinated persons by periodic PCR testing. We will first assess the COVID-19 situation on January 27th next year in a local and international context to ter determine when and how to proceed with the further relaxation of restrictions and travel. If the assessment allows, we would begin to welcome all travelers and start the reintroduction of cruise tourism. It is anticipated that at this point, there would no longer be any quarantine restrictions for any travelers, no restrictions on public gathering limits or public transport capacity, and no restrictions on certain businesses, businesses and operations such as the rental of scuba and snorkeling equipment, use of hookahs, water pipes, etc. As you have seen, this plan takes a phased approach which allows assessment at each phase. Assessments will be based on medical science and data to indicate to us either to progress or change our plans before we move to the next phase. We must remember that even with this careful and phased reopening approach, there will be risks. As we have done throughout this pandemic, we will manage these risks together in partnership as a community guided by public health. We have to realize that we may reach a juncture where some of the prior restrictions may be reintroduced. We may have to wear masks. There will be regular testing of those on front lines and possibly some dialing back of public health limits. That is all aimed at not recklessly throwing caution to the wind. To date, no country has successfully reopened without having to go back into some form of lockdown or restrictions. Given our patient and careful approach to COVID, we have the opportunity to be the first. As an aside, Sunday, 11th of July, will mark one year since our last community transmission of COVID. I don't know about you guys, but as an aside goes, I think that's one heck of a an aside. <laughs> to reinforce, to bring home the risks of reopening too soon, or in the wrong way, just take a look at our fellow overseas territory, the British Virgin Islands. They're now under a nighttime curfew and have closed bars, gyms, and hairdressers 
from Tuesday in response to a COVID-19 outbreak that took the number of active cases from close to zero to 480 in one week. The BVI government has had to bring in a wide range of new lockdown measures where businesses and restaurants must restrict customer numbers in line with social distancing protocols. We have a chance to once again defy the odds, but that will require the cooperation of the private sector, government, and all citizens. This map to reopening may include roadblocks and detours, but this plan gives us all something to work towards. And we have a significant degree of confidence in it if all goes well. As we've tried to hammer home time and again, vaccination is the best way to protect yourself, your family, and finally, our community. As we all know, nothing can live and flourish in a vacuum. Your support and engagement are key to the island's reopening strategy. I hope, no, I know we can count on your support, and I will welcome your feedback. Nothing is of greater importance to me and my government than the well-being of our people. We have spent weeks deliberating and seeking to strike the right balance, and we believe that in this plan we have a roadmap to the safe and successful reopening of our economy to tourism. Being part of this audience today allows you to be the first to have access to our safely national reopening plan. You can download the plan by using the QR code on the screen. The plan will also be published on our official CIG website shortly, which is explore uh, sorry, exploregov.ky. In closing, thank you for demonstrating amazing endurance to listen through all these lengthy remarks. Um, President Mike, uh, I think you and the Chamber members will see that my government is moving the Cayman Islands in the right direction with a common and shared vision. And realizing that vision includes the participation of all of you. I look forward to continued discussions with you and your membership on ways we can complement each other's efforts for the betterment of our people and our country. Thank you, President Mike. Thank you to the Chamber Council and all members of the Chamber of Commerce for once again hosting this important legislative luncheon. And it has been my distinct honor and privilege to be here with you today. Thank you.